Um, welcome to the second or last day of Linux Fest Northwest 2018. Uh, this talk is called Why We Can't Have Nice Things and How to Fix It. It's kind of a lie. It should be called How to Get Nice Things, but I think it's important to have a fun title. Um, so it's about improving our processes improving our infrastructure, even though we've got limited resources. Um, we don't have time, we don't have influence, and we don't have money. Um, I'm Noah Burnell. Uh, I'm not a big fan of slides, particularly of preparing them. Uh, so I have a grand total of two. Here's the first one. Um, I'm a systems engineer at Coalfire, uh, which is an IT security consulting firm. Um, the usual disclaimers apply. Nothing I'm going to say here represents Coalfire's opinions or policies. Um, personal email. If you want to talk to me about Coalfire, if you want to publicly shame me, <laughs> if you want to see any code I've written, um, this is not very uh, active lately because most of the code I'm writing is sadly closed source for coal fire. <coughs> it's not sad it's for coal fire, it's sad that it's closed source. Um, so th this talk is largely directed at someone presumably kind of like me. Um, I'm a relatively new engineer been doing it for a little over three years. Um, I'm working at a smaller company. I'm working at a company that's not a tech company. I'm in the engineering department, but it's not an engineering company. Um, so when you're in that kind of a position, your new smaller company or smaller organization within a company, and you're going, I want to be a better engineer, and I want to have a better process, and I want to not be swamped all the time. And you start looking around, you're reading blogs, you're going to conferences like this one, you're watching videos, and reading books, and reading about all the stuff you should be doing that's going to make your life better. Um, this very first example I hesitated to put in because I thought, no, of course, everyone is using version control. But um, I know that's not actually true. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you should be using version control. You should have high availability on your public services. Um, you should so many things. You should have infrastructure as code. You should be doing pair programming. Um, <clears throat> you should have everything documented. You should have your API documented for sure. You should have your processes documented. And you go, that, that sounds great. I should be doing that. That sounds really, that's going to make my life so much better, except for that. And it's going to save me so much time when I have those things. Except for that, that's what you don't have, is time. And... Some of them don't just take time and brain power and learning a new stack. Uh, they take budget and they take influence. Um, and you're a new engineer and you don't have influence and you don't have budget. Um, but the, the worst one, the one I'm going to focus on most is time. Um, so you go, how do I do this? It takes time to get high availability implemented. It's going to save me time because I'm not going to get interrupted when something goes down. If something goes down, I go, oh, yeah, I'll get to that as soon as I've finished up this thing that I'm working on because uh, I've got high availability. And my customers aren't suffering. Um, but you don't have the time because you don't have all this stuff. So how do we deal with that? Um, the very so I've I've painted this somewhat bleak picture, but I want to bring in a bright point. 
is that this is a virtuous cycle. Once you start this process, once you start thinking about this and improving your processes, obviously, yes, you do have to spend some time up front, but it's going to start saving you time. It's going to start improving your situation. It's going to start making it easier to improve your other processes. And that's kind of magical and beautiful. <laughs> um, why do we need these things? Why do we need all these processes and tools and infrastructure? Um, you know, the, the brilliant people programming in the past, the Ken Thompson in the 70s and Rob Pike in the 80s, they didn't have all this stuff. They didn't need that. Um, they didn't. They probably, they didn't have it. They probably did need it. And they kind of suffered. And they were also very brilliant. Um, <clears throat> and very experienced. Uh, Robert Martin claims, and he doesn't provide a source for this that I know, so it could be made up. But he claims that the number of software developers has been doubling about every five years for the past, I forget how many decades, I think going back to the 50s. Obviously that can't continue forever, but it has been true, is his claim. And, and he points out the implication of that is that about half of software developers at any given time have less than five years of experience. And you can take that a little further and realize that only about a quarter of software developers have got like 10 years of experience. And that might be how much it needs to be, is maybe 10 years before you can say, yeah, that's a seasoned engineer. They really know what they're doing. So what that means is most of us are new. Most of us are inexperienced. Engineering, software engineering, is full of newbies. Um, so maybe if you're brilliant and really experienced, you don't need all this, these crutches. But that's not us. It's not me. I need the crutches, the tools, the processes. So I'm not smart enough to do all this in my head. Um, the other reason why we need these tools when people <coughs> decades ago maybe didn't is that things are getting more complex. And um, you saw Brian Lunduk yesterday say that programmers are evil. He kind of implied that this increasing complexity is, is not really necessary. I think he might be right sometimes. But there is essential complexity that's growing. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that my company does is ship out devices to customers that they put behind their firewall. Those devices need to talk back to us. That communication needs to be secure. So we've got OpenVPN, great. Um, I like to use UDP for that because it's fast. However, some customers have got flaky internet connections, so we need something a little more stable. So I also want to have TCP as a failover for those customers. But I also want high availability. That means I need two machines, <coughs> each with two VPN configurations. And that means the two machines have got two different sets of IP tables rules. So there's two hosts, six configurations. Other than that, everything has to be identical, except for that I actually also need this in my dev environment and in my testing environment. So now we're at six machines, 18 configurations. Other than that, everything needs to be identical. Wait. I need security groups, external security groups or firewall rules. 
and I need routing. I'm losing track of how many different configurations we have at this point. Um, <clears throat> but I could, I could probably do this. No, I know I could do it manually. And I could probably do it without making any mistakes. But this is one piece of my infrastructure. And then, oh, I've got my configuration management. Oh, I've got my, my uh, NTP server. I've got my package repositories. It starts to be, it starts to escalate how many pieces. And that starts to be where, well, yeah, any one of those I can do manually. And I could probably do it without making mistakes. But probably <coughs> multiplied by probably multiplied by probably starts to get close to probably not. <coughs> so I, I, need, I need the tools in place. There is essential complexity. So you're thinking about all of these things that you want. And you know that there's a virtuous cycle. Once I start, things start getting better. So how do you decide? What am I going to start with? I'm going to argue that if you're just starting this process, if you're tending to be swamped, if you're putting out fires because you don't have these processes in place, that you should initially focus on low-hanging fruit. Don't look at your costs and benefits and go, oh, well, this would cost me, and these, these are dimensionless numbers I'm throwing out. They're not dollars or hours. They're just kind of numbers. Shouldn't look at option A, which costs one and benefits one, and look at option B, which costs 10 and benefits 100. Go, oh, option B is 10 times better. You don't have time. You don't have 10 to spend. You have one to spend. So spend that one. Get that one back. Um, so what, what are examples of low-hanging fruit? Uh, version control, um, if you're not using it yet, is an obvious example of low-hanging fruit. It didn't used to be low-hanging fruit in the bad old days. Um, but now we have very easy to use is the wrong word. Um, easy to implement version control. Uh, this talk is not under version control, but uh, Backwards. But now it is. Um, <laughs> this doesn't give you all of the benefits of distributed version control. This doesn't give you. Um, a defined workflow. But from now on, when I make changes in this, I at least can go back and look and see when I made it. Hopefully, if I have better commit messages than I put there, I know why I made it. And once we move on to distributing it, you know, putting it on GitHub or building our, our own Git repository, Git server, uh, then we're going to start to know who made changes, and we can start sharing it. But right now, I've improved my life. I, I now have, from now on, a history of changes that were made in this. Um, but you're probably already using version control. So, um, Documentation is another beautiful piece of low-hanging fruit. You might say, no, no, we, we've already got this stuff documented. Our API is documented. Um, 
Do you have documented what your processes are? Does everyone know what your Git workflow is? Um, does everyone know whether you use FedEx or UPS? Um, does everyone know who can approve deploys? Uh, okay, yes, everyone knows this. When you get a new person on, how long does it take them to learn these things? Do they even know what they need to learn? Does everyone around them know what they need to learn? Not really. Um, so documentation is another low-hanging fruit. And, and you might go, well, how can that be low-hanging fruit? Because you start listing these things off of what everybody needs to know. And it's huge. Um, but the very first thing that you document improves that situation. Uh, you, start a, you start a workflow document. You do it in a text format so that you can keep it under version control. And just everything, everything when, this can actually be particularly valuable when you start at a job. You're, you're learning all of this stuff about workflows. <coughs> you could even be an expert in whatever stack it is that you're using, but you're not an expert at, at your company or your organization. Um, so all these things that you're learning, you put them in a text document as you learn them. I don't mean it has to be plain text, I just mean something like markdown, HTML, ASCII doc, it doesn't matter. It could be plain text. Um, <clears throat> so that's low hanging fruit. Uh, configuration management, if you're in a sysad kind of a position, is low hanging fruit. It doesn't necessarily sound like it, but. Um, we weren't using it when I came on at Coal Fire. And then uh, one of the bash bugs, I don't remember which one, Ghost maybe? Uh, one of those came out. We had to update bash on everything. And we could have SSH'd to every machine and did yum install or yum update bash um, and instead we SSH to every machine and we did yum install salt minion <laughs> and then we set up a salt server and then we wrote one salt state that's that's a an instruction for how to how to <coughs> configure your machines that said latest version of bash and then we went to the salt master and we typed salt splat state dot high state um, the point is that we took some extra steps instead of SSHing to every machine. So in both ways of doing this, you had to SSH to every machine and do yum install something. But the configuration management way, we also had to set up a host and write one state. But the point is, so, so we'd spent extra time. But the point is, next time a bug came out that had to be immediately, rapidly fixed. We had that infrastructure in place. We didn't have to SSH to every machine again. We had to SSH to one machine. We had to write a new salt state, which is a couple lines of YUM. <coughs> so, and these are just examples. Um, once you've picked the low hanging fruit, you can start to think about bigger things, and then you start thinking about costs and benefits. 
and figuring out which ones, you know, this, this is where you can start to go, do I spend 10 and get 100 or do I spend 5 and get 10? And you might go, yeah, let's spend 10 and get 100. Let's, let's choose the more expensive, <coughs> more expensive thing. Um, you can also look at dependencies. And um, you can graph them. Uh, and I'm going to do this on the whiteboard rather than having a slide because, because this is an informal thing. What I'm suggesting is that if you're thinking about something and you're not sure, oh, do I want to do this, do I want to do that, that this is a really easy way to draw yourself a picture of if it makes sense. You go, hear about chaos monkeys. Somebody goes around and randomly knocks down servers to prove to you that your infrastructure is extremely highly available. Cool! I want a chaos monkey. Does that make sense if I don't already have high availability? No. <laughs> no. It doesn't. And in fact, as I'm starting to think about it, if I'm going to be randomly knocking down servers, I need to be able to spin them up really, really fast, exactly identical. So actually, it kind of implies that I want immutable infrastructure. And for high availability, does high availability mean anything if the two machines are not identical? <laughs> not really. So you probably want configuration management. <coughs> and in fact, to spin these up rapidly and to be able to afford it, I need to get out of the physical data center. And um, well, configuration management is just not happening without <coughs> version control. And so you kind of, A, this tells you, so there's a question, how mature do you need to be? And um, if you're this mature, you don't need to be that mature. It's meaningless. So this, this gives you, A, a kind of a picture of, is this, this sounds really cool, but it's not actually realistic because I'm right here, or I'm right here, or I'm right here. Um, so that, that's not your current goal. Wherever you are in here, it's the next step that is your current <coughs> goal. And What's cool about these, <laughs> I may use a couple of buzzwords, buzz phrases in this talk, and um, this is the first one, and I am going to assert that it is not snake oil. Uh, minimum viable product. So every step along this way gives you benefits. Even if you are targeting, oh, my, my holy grail is to have a chaos monkey. All of these steps give you something back. You don't have a chaos monkey yet, but you're getting benefits. <coughs> you know, you're, you're getting configuration management, you're saving time on that other stuff. And, and it's putting you on the road to getting this. My talk's too long for this. Um, so you've made some decisions about what's the next thing you're going to work on. Uh, you need to get it implemented. And sometimes you need to sell these ideas to your fellow engineers. Um, this is the portion of the talk that I'm really bad at. Um, <clears throat> I uh, committed this. I'll push it up to GitHub later today. And uh, if you have some really great, simple uh, ideas about how to sell process changes or infrastructure changes to your fellow engineers, uh, make a pull request, please. <laughs> um, how do you sell it to your manager? Um, that's a lot easier, I think. 
these, these are my three C's of selling it to your manager. Costs and values, credibility, conspiracy. Uh, costs and values, that's the same costs and benefits that you yourself were thinking about before. You do need to think about how you present them. Uh, for costs, I'm not saying... Essentially, I, I, I'm saying that you should uh, let your manager interpret these costs that you're giving her or him. Um, you should say, I, I think this would take me about two days. Um, we're going to need to uh, run five T2 micro instances in AWS. And um, uh, the license for this software is $600 a year. Um, it's not your job to say, well, I make this much annually, therefore two days is this many dollars. It's not your job to figure out whether um, whether the costs are capitalizable or operational. Exp None of that's your job. That's your manager's problem. But you do need to be able to present, lay out what, what these are. It's their job to interpret it. And then you need to give them values. And those need to be business values, or organizational values. Even though when you were looking at values, you were going, this means that I don't get woken up on the weekend, or this means that I don't have to spend time uh, SSHing into every machine. It's true that you are kind of a customer of your own work, but you're um, not a very important customer. What's up? Couldn't your boss not having to pay you to come in on the weekends? Yeah, yeah. That's that's what I'm what I'm getting at. Is you're looking at it as I want this, and you're a customer. But when you present it to your boss. It needs to be, this will free up my time to work on this. And often there are uh, internal or public customer implications, high availability. <laughs> As a customer, I'd like to be able to uh, reach the website. So even though you're not looking at it and going, well, I, I mean, hopefully you are looking at it and going, yeah, I want our customers to have a good experience. But, but that, that's, that's not what's driving you to want that. Um, but but you, you do need to, to give those values to your supervisor. Um, the second C, credibility. Uh, where do you get that? Um, it would seem like you could say, well, a great way to get credibility is to be really good at your job, to be um, just a rock star. And um, that's not happening. As I mentioned, we're all new. We're mostly all new. And um, we're not geniuses. Um, <clears throat> we're just people, and uh, so yeah, that's not an option. Um, and it, if it were, I think we all know people who are incredibly competent who we do not trust. So uh, we need to find some other way of getting credibility, and it's not instant. Um, there's a book by Sam Harris called On Lying. Uh, I should mention Sam Harris has some other unpopular ideas. And uh, if you look into it and you have a beef with him, um, his book On Lying stands alone, independent of any other unpopular ideas he has. Uh, his thesis is that, uh, for the most part, most of the time, it's pretty much a good idea to not lie, really, at all. Um, I mentioned this to a friend, and he said, well, if I didn't lie every day, I'd get kicked in the groin. But 
he's not talking about being crass. Uh, you're walking down, the, he's not suggesting that as you walk down the street, that he, oh God, sir, your hat is so stupid. Um, he kind of, he defines honesty as if someone is expecting information from you that you are not misinforming them. And that kind of covers lies of omission also. Uh, if you had servers go down last night, your supervisor is not asking you every morning, did any servers go down? But if you didn't mention that, it's kind of a lie. Uh, found a serious vulnerability and you quietly fix it, and commit the change. Um, that's kind of a lie. Uh, but it also covers the positive things. Um, how did this happen? It was just a fluke. That's a lie. So if, if you start to kind of get in the habit of uh, of being able to say things like, I made a mistake, or I found a bug, uh, it's pretty scary, it took me about an hour to fix it, it's taken care of, but um, if, you start to, if you start to be seen as being able to say these embarrassing things, Like, I don't know, what, what, is, uh, what is that? What does that acronym stand for? I, I'm not familiar with that stack. Hopefully, eventually, when you start saying things like, this is going to save me a lot of time and it's also going to make our infrastructure more stable. People, people might start to think, well, you know, Noah doesn't, uh, Noah's willing to admit flaws, so I, I, I think I, I might be able to trust his judgment on this. Um, it's an interesting idea of pretty much never lying. It's, it's, um, it's a little harder than you might initially think, but it's, I think it's worth trying out. Um, <clears throat> you can also get some credibility by being customer oriented. And again, that was when we we're talking about values, trying to, trying to bring in business values. And you can show that you're not a collector of shiny <coughs> objects. Um, we all want to learn new cool things. Um, but if you're a Python shop and you're trying to bring in Go, you'd better really need concurrency for whatever this project is. Uh, but there are ways. There are ways of getting shiny, fun things. I've been really fascinated by graphs for the last year or two. Um, <clears throat> so if you do, if you do want to bring in some shiny stack, um, bring in a proof of concept. Uh, my first one for graphs is we had an audit. We needed to show. We needed to list all of the, um, everything that every IAM user can do in AWS. So every, everything that each user is authorized to do. And I started clicking through the interface in the AWS console and realized that the way permissions are granted in AWS is, um, well, it's not a flat list. Uh, so I, I wrote a little program to go out and go for each AWS IAM user. Um, what are their inline permissions? What policies are they attached to and what are the permissions of those? What groups are they members of? 
and what are the inline permissions in that group, and what policies are attached to that group, and draw a graph, something like that, but with permissions. And then, and then I could, and then the script could go through and, and just gather all of those permissions and put them in a list. But so our, our audit report had for each user a little graph, three, four, five nodes, and then a list. My supervisor went, wow, that's really cool. How'd you do that? It's like Boto3 and Pygraph is. And, and this has made it more plausible for me to be able to play with graphs and, and play with graph stacks. So my supervisor's already seen that I can bring value with that. Uh, conspiracy, the third C, you, you have to be careful with this. Um, if you have an improvement that's going to improve your security stance, and you've got a CISO at your organization or someone who's in charge of security, you could go to them and say, hey, I've been thinking about this, and, and they could kind of bring it back to your manager and say, I'd, I'd like to have this implemented. <coughs> You've got to be really careful with that. You need to know the political lay of the land, um, <coughs> whether or not that's going to be looked at as being proactive or if it's going to be looked at as <coughs> sneaking around. So uh, it's, it's, it's a possibility, but it's uh, not my first go-to. Um, but it's something you can think about. There is a fourth C, kindness. <laughs> <laughs> Mysteries of English orthography. Um, if you're nice to people, if you don't interrupt them, if you don't, if you show interest in their, uh, in their well-being, in in their interests, um, <clears throat> they may want to uh, hear what you have to say a little more often than otherwise. Um, this is entirely leaving out any ethical implications of trying to make the world around you a little bit nicer from a pure self-interest standpoint. Um, being nice probably has some benefits. Uh, so that's selling it to your manager. Um, you don't need to sell it to your manager sometimes. Uh, You can uh, put something in version control without ever consulting with anyone. You can start documenting things without ever consulting anyone. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <coughs> you can probably, I'm not going to try to sell you on pair programming because I'm not actually sold on it myself. I don't, I don't know. But if, it, if it's something you're, you're wanting to try out, you can probably do that without consulting with your manager. Um, <clears throat> it might be an, again, you'd want to be aware of the political lay of the land, but it might be an interesting exercise to, uh, without really telling anyone, start collaborating with one of your fellow engineers and pair programming, and then after a month or so, say, you know, go to your manager and say, um, so we've, we've been trying out pair programming. We're wondering um, if uh, you can see any difference, better or worse, in our escaped bug rate or our velocity or um, hours we spent versus hours that we estimated. Um, has it changed at all? Um, there are a lot of things you can do without really needing your manager's buy-in. Um, they hopefully want you to succeed, uh, and they hopefully understand that you are the engineer and they are the manager, and that, uh, that as an engineer that you are trying to improve your processes. Uh, but if it's going to take a lot of your time, defined as maybe more than half a day 
or if it needs budget, or if there are security implications. Yeah, you, you will need buy-in, but for a shocking number of things, you don't need manager buy-in. Uh, is it 10.15 that this ends? Okay. I'm going to skip the two hard problems. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is uh, uh, diversity and ethics. And I think we need both of them, but they're uh, bigger than five minutes. We'll allow for, and we're going to move on to the last slide. Um, my wife embroidered this. Um, that's not usually her craft of choice. She's a very skilled knitter. Uh, but um, after the last couple of years, she needed something to cheer her up, and she saw this and embroidered it. And uh, right before I left for the train, I was looked at this and realized I don't really actually need to give this talk. I could just take a picture of this pillow. Not sure how well you can read it. Start where you are. Use what you have. And do what you can. And um, I think that kind of summarizes the talk. Any questions? Comments? Complaints? What's yes. What's that? What's uh, it's the idea that you have two developers who, instead of working on their own, they actually literally sit at the same machine Someone might sit and the other might stand at their shoulder. Usually they call it driving and directing, I think. Um, it sounds like you're throwing two people, you know, only one person's typing, so how can that be productive? Why don't you um, save a workstation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, th I think the argument is that, is that you're kind of talking out loud and... You know, so often that resolves so many of our problems where, where you, you can't figure this out and you go, okay, so let me, let me tell you about what I'm trying to do and I just can't figure this one. Oh, never mind, thanks. You, you figure it out by talking about it. And so if you just formalize that and get two people together so they're constantly talking, uh, supposedly you can get improvements in efficiency and style that make up for the fact that you've got two people with one keyboard. Um, it's, it sounds really cool to me, but I haven't really tried it out. So, so I, I don't know. Um, anyway. What's that? It does work, but we do it with two workstations and two keyboards, and then you use two mouse. OK. So if you have two mouse, and then you know, UI, everyone can do what they need to do. And actually, it would be like three people to do it. OK. So it feels like it works, or you've or you've been Some able to measure really velocity, or oh, yeah, no, it, there's a hard, it, it doesn't work for stupid stuff. Right? Like, I mean, you know, just plain procedural stuff. I mean, why bother? So if it's like you have a hard problem, uh -huh. it's much better if you have two people. Okay, I mean that sounds totally plausible. <laughs> no, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> What else? What's what's um, what's low hanging fruit at your organization? Do you have a separate question? Do they have to spell it right now? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> N e i r n e l. Yes. So yes. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I wonder why. I just Sorry. I I opened it only only a few months ago. I think. I think I've sent two tweets. <laughs> 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 I 
Yeah. Sweet, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. I am. Yeah. Um, no, say it. What's what's low hanging fruit or? Um, kind of along the lines of what you were mentioning. One of the things that we do is um, we keep all of our engineering docs in a GitHub repository. Uh huh. Awesome. That's beautiful. I think uh, uh, wikis are another alternative. Um, although, I, I don't know my wiki software well enough to, to know how trackable the history of it. I guess Wikimedia, you can really look at the history really well. What's up? Yeah, now our organization we use Confluence, and then it's all version and everything, so it's great. Okay. And that's a, a wiki software? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a paid one, but that's pretty good. Cool. Um, what's the nice stuff that you want? You seem to buy into the idea of documentation. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and that's the thing I was talking about not being good at, is, is selling stuff to your fellow engineers. I did, um, at a <coughs> Terraform talk, it's a tool for, um, uh, Managing your infrastructure as code, um, which is a beautiful idea because it gets under version control. Uh, <laughs> you can see why that server was spun up, why that security group rule was changed. Um, so I'm using it. I love it. I'm a fanboy, but I'm, I have a hard time evangelizing it in my organization, and I. I asked a speaker at a Terraform talk, so how do you convince your other engineers to uh, stop going into the AWS console and clicking on things and put it in code? And he said, shame. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you go, you go, you're smarter than I am, but your stuff breaks and mine doesn't. And that's because I've got a tool. Um, I don't know. That that's still something I, I really need help with. Is how, how do you sell this stuff to your engineers, sisters and brothers? Um, we're supposedly over time, but nobody's kicking us out. So, yes. I guess what I'd like is more um, more feedback. Of what customer is really going to want? What the end? What the end? That what you're working on is something that the end user is really going to. You're saying that that's, that's important to keep in mind? Yeah. I, I would definitely agree. Um, and it's, I mean, that's, that's an important mindset to be in, and it's something that as engineers we're often very bad at. Um, and I, I, we, we do have to, to fight that tendency to go, oh, stupid users. The users are why we're here. Um, you, need a, you need a guy to take the specifications from the customer. Give, give the yeah, <laughs> you need um, a buzzword. You know, you but sometimes you actually want to break down that work small, right? You yeah, want to say, hey, this space rep, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. actually mean that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yes, you, you need agile methodologies, <laughs> <laughs> which I will assert is not snake oil. Um, look up the agile manifesto. Um, yeah, it's it's not something that managers are imposing on us. Agile is something that engineers came up with and said, we need this. Too much feature creep. It looks cool, so let's do it. Having been a, the guys people like to hate, I was a software test engineer. Uh -huh. I would say, you know, you write it, I break it. You write it, I break it. Yeah. Soon. It either goes out bad or you kill me. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that I worked with people who didn't even have a computer of their own at home. They wrote code all day, and they never worked in the business environment for which the code was being written for. They had no clue as to how an end user was going to put it to use, or what an end user's management might want yeah. from, the, from the software. I, it's strange, but I, I think that actually can work in a way. <laughs> 
if, if you've got a really good process and, and organization and structure so that, and, and you've got the kind of programmers who are willing to hear, I need you to write a function that returns this with these inputs, um, they maybe don't have to be all that customer yeah, oriented, user, but that's... Is it going to actually use it? Is it going to make the user more productive for their management? Is it going to make them easier to convince their managers to buy your software? Yeah, well, you know what? I think that that's the product owner's problem or your manager's problem. I don't actually think that that's an engineer's problem. We, we should be aware that customers use it, but we're not design people. We're not UX people. I mean, if you're a UX person, then you're a UX person. But, but if you're writing software, you're probably not a UX person. Um, yes? One method that I found to help uh, sell things, especially uh -huh. inside the company, is to create a buzz. And you can do that by uh, utilizing gossip against your own team. <laughs> um, so what you do is you, you find something that you're interested in bringing in, something really cool, right, that you know it's going to solve a problem. And you go to someone who's affected by that problem and you say, hey, wouldn't it be great if you could do this by doing this, this, and that? And take their feedback and say, okay, I'm working on a super secret project. It's this. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. <laughs>